Hello everybody and welcome to Friday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. Loads to catch up on, we didn't have a news show yesterday, that's because if you didn't catch the stream, just let me hit you with this fact. I raced on Zwift last night, my average heart rate was 183 beats a minute, that was for a half an hour race. Let that sink in, that was mental. Anyway, if you want to watch it, you can, you can follow it up there. If you've not done already, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you know when we go live with our live videos. And as long as you hit that notification, you'll get notified when we do. Win Your Dream Bike Draw is now open. Don't forget that opened on the 14th of October. We're giving away a Pinarello F12. Link is down in the description if you want to stand a chance of winning it. Go there right now so I don't have to mention it again. All right? News time. So first up, let's catch up with all the action from the last two stages of the Giro. Stage 13 is currently going off right now. I'll give you the results of that at the end of the show. But stage 10 was won once again by Arna Demar. That makes four victories at this year's Giro d'Italia. I reckon there's a fifth in there somewhere. Leave your predictions down below. When do you think Arna Demar is going to get that fifth victory at the Giro d'Italia? I don't know. The last Frenchman to win four stages at the Giro d'Italia, a very famous one named Bernard Eno. So it goes without saying that Arnaud Demar has um, he's done something pretty special there. And he's on amazing form. He certainly does. St Listen, still don't like Arnaud Demar after he beat Swifty at the Milan San Remo. I'm never going to forgive him for that. Never, ever, ever, ever. But credit where credit's due, he is on some serious form. However, stage 12 was never going to be won by him because it was won by Jonathan, however Rob Ash pronounces it on, um, on Eurosport, Jonathan. Navarez. He was part of a large breakaway that got up the road early on. That breakaway managed to get around 13 minutes up the road on the GC contenders and that main peloton. And then halfway through the race, it looked like those GC contenders were just having a massive scrap. A lot of aggressive racing going on, a lot of the pace being set by NTT, clearly trying to work for Domenico Pozzovivo, trying to get him up the road, potentially get some time on the rest of his GC rivals. But it all just kind of fizzled out to nothing. It's really hard to try and follow a race when there's so much action in the breakaway and so much action going off back at the uh, the GC group. And at times it was hard to actually work out what was going on. But yeah, Padun and Navarez managed to get themselves up the road. They got a nice tasty lead on the rest of that breakaway and then the rest of the peloton. They would fight it out for victory, but with 24 kilometers to go, Padun suffered a bit of a mechanical. He needed a front wheel replacement. That meant he spent the rest of the race chasing down Navarez, who was more than capable of making sure that that gap stayed constant between him and Padun, making sure that Ineos took another stage victory. I think Garner's won two, Navarez has won one. Who was the other one that won one? Ah. No, sorry, it was three. Uh, Garner with two, Navarez with one. It was Castro Viejo I was thinking about when he finished second on that rainy, horrible stage last weekend. But I've got to say, I am absolutely loving this new Ineos Grenadiers approach to racing. It's refreshing. It's better to see them doing this than it is to see them chasing down that GC. I'm kind of sick of that old style racing. That These riders that are getting checked, like Garner would never have got the chance to win. Swifty would never have got the chance to race with Peter Sagan for stage 10. St Stage 10, unfortunately they didn't have the legs, but it was, again, had G been there, he would have had no chance of even getting in that break in the first instance. Same with Nevada's yesterday. This is amazing, like, it proves that this team is a good team, regardless of what their roles are. But it makes you wonder how many riders have sacrificed their own potential stage wins for the greater good of the team. Like, we look at Quiato at the Tour de France, Carapaz at the Tour de France, and as soon as Egan left, these riders were able to flourish in breakaways and be really, really aggressive. And it made for some entertaining races. I'll be honest, once the GC riders went, we've got G in the Giro, Egan Manal at the, uh, the Tour de France, I honestly thought that the rest of the team would just implode and like not have a clue what to do. But these riders stepped up, they got aggressive, they got in breaks and they got stage victories. So let me know down in the comments below, what do you think to this, this free roaming, aggressive team Ineos Grenadiers? I, I for one, prefer it over there. They're monotonous, predictable, boring racing of old. Yeah, let me know down below. Now, sticking with the Giro, I want your opinion on this. EF Pro Cycling have issued a letter to the UCI 
to the RCS, the organizers of the Giro, stakeholders and teams requesting that the Giro be stopped at the second rest day. The UCI were quick to reject this. In fact, it was so quick, uh, the letter hadn't even got out of the fax machine. They don't use fax machines anymore, do they? That's a reference that the majority of you won't even get. Had they been using fax machines, the UCI wouldn't have even let the letter print out before they were rejecting it. Anyway, that's by the by. The UCI rejected the letter, but in the letter, they made some very valid points. Check it out. So in the letter they wrote, with a clear compromise bubble and an expected lag between exposure and symptoms stroke positives, it must be expected that further illness will result. This is not a given, but the precautionary principle would suggest we act responsibly and adopt a conservative approach. For the health and safety of riders, staff and the communities through which we have to race, we recommend that the Giro be stopped early. We believe it will be better for the Giro and the UCI World Tour should this be done in a systematic, holistic way versus a chaotic withdrawal on a team-by-team -team basis. The second rest day seems a natural break in the race to declare winners and a successful 2020 Giro d'Italia. In the meantime, we support the idea of at least two systematic COVID tests before the rest day and an earlier close to the race if additional tests return positive prior to the rest day. And that's what's going ahead. They're taking um, two days of precautionary tests, I believe, prior to the rest day. I don't know if that's today and tomorrow or yesterday and today, uh, but we'll see. It clearly seems that the, the bubble has been compromised when you go over on Twitter and you see that teams are hanging out in hotels and there's general public in there and people aren't wearing the masks and people are in close confinement. It's unsurprising that they feel that this this bubble has been um, compromised. But then we look back to the Tour de France and we look how well the, the ASO managed to manage the, the bubble there. We had a lot more fans on the side of the road. A lot of those weren't wearing masks. A lot of those were still getting in the riders' faces and yet they were still able to keep the riders safe in their, in their protective bubbles and we had minimal positive tests. Look at the Giro d'Italia and it all kind of kicked off with Simon Yates testing positive on the Saturday. He got booted out of the tour. And then four additional people, I think they were staff members from Mitchelton Scott, also tested positive alongside Michael Matthews, Stephen Kurzweig, a couple of backroom staff at AG2R and Ineos Grenadiers as well. So you can see that potentially uh, this second rest day, we're going to see even more positive tests as that lag, like, like the EF Pro Cycling said in that letter, the lag between exposure and positive tests. We're further down the line now, the lag is over. So we're at, yeah, I can't help thinking that we're going to see a lot more positive tests. I'll be surprised if there isn't as many, if not more, than what we saw on the first rest day. But if that's the case, what's gonna happen? At what point are they gonna say, enough's enough? How many teams would have to pull out for them to say, no more? Or is it literally gonna be last man standing? But yeah, let me know your thoughts on this one. If we were in charge of it right now, what would we do? Would we pull it at the rest day and announce the winner there? Would we just say, listen, it's go. we said it's going to Milan and it's going to Milan and that is that. Next up, one rider who isn't going to have to worry about the 2021 season is Jürgen Rolands as he announced his retirement from professional cycling. Rolands was set to ride the Tour of Flanders this weekend, but unfortunately he suffered a crash at the Bing Bang Tour that suffered, where he suffered a shoulder injury, bringing a premature end to his season and now essentially bringing a premature end slightly to his racing career. On the retirement, Rolands said, It was a tough decision to make especially since cycling has always been such a big part of my life, all right? I started cycling from the age of 12. That makes 24 seasons in total. That was a tough decision to make, especially since cycling has always been a big part of my life. I started cycling from the age of 12. That makes 24 seasons in total. All right, however, due to the circumstances and the various injuries, I'm not able to compete at the highest level or a level that I'd like to be at. I know I still have what it takes to compete at World Tour races, no doubt, right? But training and racing with pain day in, day out makes it incredibly hard physically and mentally. So there you go, Jürgen Rollins retiring at the ripe old age of 35. Technically just hitting his peak, isn't he? I mean, I've not even hit my peak and I'm a little bit older than that. Anyway, talking of retirement, big news out of the Women's World Tour. As Equipe Polka announced over on Twitter that it is with great regret that Equipe Polka announces the immediate closure of the team, currently ranked fourth in the world due to the absence of sponsor payments since August. 
The statement over on their website then says this is an extremely sad moment in the 15 year history of the squad, which prides itself on the development of exciting young talent within the peloton. The teams, riders and staff were looking forward to spending several more years together in the pursuit of sportive success. Having already recommenced the season with a series of victories and top results, including an emphatic Giro Rosa stage win, silver at the UCI World Championships, bronze at the European Championships, as well as multiple national championship titles. However, this can regret no longer be our shared goal with the team being forced to dissolve after a decade and a half in the peloton. Now our main aim is to find both riders and staff new teams to secure their futures. I really don't want to say about this one. Fourth highest ranked team in the world has not been paid since August. They've had to just shut the team down right here right now and that's going to be good for absolutely nobody. Uh, riders without a team to ride for now. Yes all right the, the season's coming to an end but there's still plenty of races to be had out there. There's still plenty of points to be proven to make sure that you get a contract for next year. Lizzie Banks, she took a victory at the Giro Rosa. She was also in that race with Lizzie Dagnan, which was Plouet, where she finished second. So she's one of the hottest properties in women's world tour cycling. I'm not objectifying her there as, a, as nothing more than an object by saying she's one of the hottest properties, but it's a figure of speech. She's one of the most sought out after riders. She's amazing. That's what I'm trying to say. All right. Good. So hopefully the staff members are going to find jobs elsewhere, but there's one less team. So that means more of these riders have to go to other teams. I don't think there's anything much more to say on that. Anyway, let's move on with rest at news. Fast finish. It's going to be a blanket finish. Can the overall leader get it? I think at least... Well, there you go. Have that. What a cracking stage. If you've not watched it, make sure you check out the highlights. Pan flat all day apart from two little spikes right at the end. And those spikes caused some drama for the sprinters. We were expecting it to be a bit of a sprint stage. Breakaway went nice and early as usual. You can see 157 kilometers to go. Breakaway up to 2 minutes and 58. And it stayed pretty consistent. A couple of K later, 2.45. Lovely shot that. Lovely, clear, crisp <laughs> screenshot of the TV. Shh. What? Carry on. And you can see here with 32 kilometers to go, we're now at those two little spikes towards the end of the stage. 53 seconds is the gap to this group and the breakaway group. Peter Sagan put his Bora Hands Grower team to good use, trying to do essentially what he tried to do at the Tour de France a couple of times, get on the front, smash it to pieces. He was, he was riding against Sam Bennett at the Tour de France. He was trying to dispatch Sam Bennett and Deconic Quickstep off the bike, doing exactly the same here with Arna Demar and Groupama FDJ, trying to just dispatch them off the bike so potentially he could go for that victory and then hopefully reduce that gap of points between him and Arna Demar for that Malia Chiclamina. And it worked. As you can see here, they're just about to head up the second of those little spikes and right at the back on the right-hand side of the road, Arna Demar had to be towed back up to this group. So Bora Hansgrohe managed to do a job of dispatching him just a little bit and with a steeper climb coming up, it was, it was a good chance that um, Arna Demar was going to be out the back again. And you can see on the left-hand side of the road there, Deconi Quickstep assembling themselves at the front, protecting Zhao Almeida, ready for a bit of a... Well, I mean, this was a surprise to, uh, to me as it was to everybody else, I think, watching. On this final climb, Teo Gagan Hart had a little bit of a, a zest out. He tried to attack the group. Real steep, real, real steep, really sort of the men from the boys this one did. Brought all the GC contenders to the front, but again, only a short, snappy climb, so they weren't necessarily going to try and take time over each other. However, what it did do was pretty much dispatch everybody else from the race. So, running into the line on that descent, then across the flats to the finish line, it ended up being a bit of a GC battle. And you can see here, 5.9 kilometers to go. This, I believe, was the Arna de Mar group. I could be wrong, I don't know. Anyway, but you can see there, top left corner, Peter Sagan's group. Uh, there was Peter Sagan in there, there was Swifty was in there, one of the Deconi Quickstep riders was in there, and Thomas again. And at one point it looked like potentially they might be pulling themselves back to that front group and those GC contenders. And had those three riders got back to the front, it would have been a sprint between, definitely between Ben Swift and Peter Sagan. Arna Demar weren't getting back there. You can see on the shot there that he was one minute and one seconds back. And then coming into the finish line, it was a sprint finish, but it was down to those GC contenders. Teo Gagan Hart, you can see there in fourth place. In third was Patrick Conrad for Bora Hansgrohe, so almost making up for the fact that Peter Sagan wasn't there in the sprint. Zhao Almeida, the Malio Rosa, he was in second place. And the winner, 
and his eighth stage victory was Diego Hulisi. Rider of the day has to go to James Knox. He made sure that he was looking after Zhao Almeida up that final climb, then he just sat on the front and he just carried on going full gas, making sure none of those big sprinters were going to get back to this group, meaning Zhao Almeida could actually fight for the victory and those time bonuses. So very little has changed in that GC. However, it now looks like this. And you're going to say, Chris, that looks exactly the same as it did yesterday. Yeah, it did. Apart from Zhao Almeida put six seconds into everybody else. Not a massive amount, but still. It means he's got six seconds in his pocket for, for doing very little, just sitting behind James Knox and, uh, and getting towed to the line. So uh, great, great, great result. And I, I can't remember if I said this in the preview, but I tipped this guy for a podium. Please don't prove me wrong. I didn't put any money on him, so there's a good chance he is going to be on the podium. If I'd have put any money on him, it'd have probably crashed and retired by now. But anyway, that is the end of the show. We've got the time trial coming up on Saturday. Then there's a mountain stage on the Sunday. Then the Giro gets cancelled on the Monday after all the COVID tests come back positive. Fingers crossed that won't happen. I'm staying positive. Not COVID positive, just positive mindset that we will get through the final week of the Giro d'Italia. Leave all your comments down below on everything that we've talked about. Whatever tickles your fancy, write them down, even if you want to slide me off. See if I care. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great weekend. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that dislike button if you've not enjoyed it. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you know when we go live with our videos and our live streams. See you Monday.